Thank you for joining us for today's panel. If you'd like more information, please keep an eye out for our upcoming Writing for Television class with Teresa Wong. Watch our education and outreach programs for enrollment announcements coming this fall. And this weekend, we join all of Little Tokyo to celebrate Nisei Week, starting August 15th and 16th. Two nights of programming for the first virtual Nisei Week celebration. Presented by Kirin and Dei Li Foods. Featuring performances from Cold Tofu Improv, Tuesday Night Project, a kid's cooking demo with up-and-coming YouTuber Easy Peasy Jordan, and Ondo Dancing with the 2019 Nisei Week Court and special guests. Content will be available on the Nisei Week Foundation's Facebook Live and YouTube pages starting at 4 o'clock p.m. each day. And the festivities continue next week on Wednesday, August 19th at 5 o'clock p.m. East West Wednesdays welcomes our arts producers of Little Tokyo panel, a meeting of the minds of the many Asian American arts organizations that call Little Tokyo home. And finally, we close out the week with Crazy Talented Asians Nisei Week Edition. Presented by AJ Raphael, East West Players, the Nisei Week Foundation, and Nisei Week Virtual Series. An online concert, celebration, and performances from East West Players' friends and Little Tokyo favorites, including Tycho Project, DD Magno Hall, Paul Date, and of course, AJ Raphael himself. You will not want to miss it. Happy Nisei Week! <laughs> Hi everyone, my name is Teresa Wong. I am a supporter of the East West Players, a television writer, and I currently teach television writing for emerging Asian American writers at East West. And thank you so much for joining us today for this discussion with television showrunners and writers, all about representation in television and this time that we're in where storytelling is more authentic and diverse than it's ever been. So I'm joined here by several wonderful friends and writers who I've gotten to know personally over the years, and um, I'm going to let them each introduce themselves briefly uh, with who they are, what they're working on, and when they decided to become a writer, why television was the medium for them. So first we have Leo Chu and Eric Garcia. Hi, I'm Leo Chu. I'm one half of the writing team of Leo Chu and Eric Garcia. We are television showrunners and TV creators. Um, we primarily work in either half hour comedies, so it's like YA dramedies, half hour comedies, family comedies, or you might know our work from sort of the badass animes that we make, like Batman Ninja and Afro Samurai. Um, I actually got started in this business um, a long time ago. Uh, I had a whole nother life where I was a television executive um, over at Disney. Um, let me take that back. I actually started a long time ago in a whole nother life where I was an executive at Disney. Um, I was an executive at Walt Disney Feature Animation, and I worked on such movies as uh, Finding Nemo, um, Ruin Stitch. I was in Japan for a little bit, working on Spirited Away, so you kind of get where the anime interest sort of came from. Um, and what happened was I hit my 10-year anniversary at Disney, and apparently at Disney what happens when you hit your 10-year anniversary is it's a little party for you. Um, and then you get your picture taken with the CEO of the company at the time was Michael Eisner. And then I was like, man, I've been here for 10 years and I'll have to show for it is like a picture of Michael Eisner. I was like, I actually moved down here to be a writer. Like what happened? And so I kind of shifted gears back to what I originally came down to LA to do and um, started writing. And that's about the time that I met Eric Garcia. Hi, I'm Eric Garcia. I'm the other half of the writing team uh, with Mr. Leo Chu. Uh, and I have the great fortune to work with him for many years, being a um, TV showrunner and TV creator. Um, yes, uh, in addition to the other couple things that we worked on, um, we worked on Alexa and Katie, um, and, which was, I'm sorry, what was, what was, did Leo, did you mention all those things or no? No. no. Okay. So, um, so yes, I'm a writer, producer, showrunner. Um, um, I first got into writing because uh, it was the only vehicle that really kind of was able to um, let me be creative in all the numerous ways that I wanted to be. Uh, I originally started off as a painter in college and um, I suffered quite a lot from that. Um, but I found like, you know, in the visual meeting, medium, of, uh, of film and television, uh, I was able to kind of like add all of those extra things, themes, um, story, 
um, symbolism that um, that I wanted to do. So that's really what got me into it. I love that. Um, thank you so much for joining us. And now we're going to move on to Melinda Sue Taylor. Hi, I'm Melinda Sue Taylor. I'm the showrunner of Nancy Drew on the CW. I've been at this for a while, and uh, you know I love TV. But originally came out here to write features. I'd gone to film school, and it was all about features and indie film. And I came out here and wrote many, many screenplays, and uh, never got anywhere. But you know, could not get arrested. And then finally, um, my boyfriend at the time, who's now my husband, said you should apply for this thing called the Warner Brothers Writers Workshop. And I was like, oh, I don't even watch TV. I work alone. You know, <laughs> refused and refused. But he cajoled me into. I was like, oh, I guess I could like hang out a Law & Order spec. And I had never even really watched Law & Order, but I knew that it was on every night, so I wouldn't have to do any extra like legwork to acquire <laughs> episodes to watch. And so I was, I took a yellow pad and I was like, okay, minute one. Two guys move in the couch, they're bantering me. Oh my God, they found a body. Okay. <laughs> like the cops show up, they had no defensive wounds, she's been moved, she's been over here. Somebody makes a joke about traffic titles. I was like, I can do this. <laughs> I mean, Longhorn is actually a great show to analyze for that. I got into the program. People started to return my phone calls. I realized that it was a thing that made sense to me, the way that, like, arcs happen for characters, the episodes over the season, the act breaks themselves. It just made sense to how my brain is hardware. So I was like, well, this is it for me. Also, they pay you every week. I really like that. <laughs> so yeah. after that, I was, like, on my way and uh, got my first jobs as a diversity writer, which we can talk more about later. Mm -hmm. Welcome. All right, next we're going to go to April Shee. Hi, I'm April Shee. Um, I am currently a supervising producer on the season two of D on FXX. Um, and I've been fortunate enough to work in both half hour kind of cable comedy dramedies and also hour long cable limited historical um, biopics, I guess. <laughs> so I have two very kind of specific niches, and both are incredibly fun and fulfilling and a uh, very different world. So um, I have always been a storyteller, but I never really knew that TV writing was a thing ever. I loved TV growing up, but I, I had like my eye on the prize of feature film since I was, you know, in high school. I took my first screenwriting class when I was 15. Um, and I went to NYU for film and wanted to be this like indie film darling. But unfortunately it did not happen. <laughs> I was, kind of wearing every hat imaginable in the indie film world and got experience like editing and, you know, production coordinating and accounting. And I'm like, this is like not at all what I wanted to do. And, you know, making movies on your own gets very expensive. So I turned to kind of the cheaper way of experimenting and that was writing. And around this time, I happened to discover by chance that TV writing was a thing. There's such a thing as a writer's room and that it's just a bunch of amazing, smart people sitting around a table and eating snacks while talking about stories and stuff. I was like, oh, well, that's clearly what I want to do. And um, so, yeah, that's kind of how I got into television. And I've uh, been lucky enough to work on some awesome shows. Um, yeah, my journey. Awesome. And next we have Ray Uternachit. Hi. Um, as uh, Teresa said, my name is Ray Uternachit. Um, I am originally from the great state of Michigan, uh, but I came out here a long time ago to uh, work in uh, to work in film originally. Um, you know, and I I have to say, like I I knew I always wanted to be a writer on some level because um, back in Michigan with my brothers and I, I and, and my cousins and I we would we would like make these like kung fu movies. And like, you know, we, were, we came up with all these cool fight sequences, but then we realized like, well, you know, we need to figure out what the story is. Like, why are the rebels fighting the master who's trying to take over the village? And so I was like, oh my God, you're right. So I took a notepad, like a yellow notepad. And I think at that point I had like bought one screenwriting book, which I think there was only one on the bookshelves at the time. Uh, this is a long time ago. And I was like, oh yeah, okay, well, I think I kind of know how to do this. And I wrote out this little story, like kind of piecing together these fight sequences. Um, and together with that, and like, you know, watching um, behind the scenes footage of Star Wars when I was a little kid, just like watching them shoot like miniatures and explosions. And like, I was like, this is exactly what I want to do with my life. <laughs> um, so when I came out to LA a long time ago, I think like Melinda and April, like, 
I thought I was going to work in film. I thought I was going to write movies. Um, and, and then you get out here and you're, re and at the time, you know, like there was no, there were no classes on how to write for TV. Like that was not, not even offered as a wow. curriculum at school. I don't even think there were as a curriculum anywhere at the time. And you start learning about writer's rooms and you start learning about like, oh yeah, like actually people write these TV shows. Like it's one of these things that just like occurs to you. Like, um, so I think what I liked about that in general um, is that, you know, TV tells story in a different way. And I, and I, you know, we all grew up watching TV and what I think you realize is like, the stories on TV can really evolve. And I think that what that sort of, and the characters can evolve. And I think what I really liked about that versus, um, you know, film screenwriting was that you can kind of live with these characters and go on this really long journey. Um, and so that's sort of why I, I sort of fell in love with TV writing. And, um, you know, I eventually got into um, a version of the uh, Warner Brothers uh, workshop um, like Melinda. Um, Melinda, I don't know when you, you got your, uh, you got in, but I was, I was there a long time ago. It was actually, before like the sort of regime that's in there now um and you know through their encouragement and some help and, and and after some years i was able to like kind of quote unquote break in after you know 10 years of trying <laughs> but uh but that's yeah that's my that's how that's my breaking in story <laughs> wonderful i love hearing all of those stories and i like how that there's a common theme that we all sort of discovered tv writing um uh you know after deciding to become writers. I think it's really funny. I feel like still feel, people still now think that the actors just make up their own dialogue. They don't realize that there are a whole room of writers creating all of those scripts and all of those stories. So uh, uh, thank you all so much for being here. This is gonna be a fun conversation. So we're gonna start with Melinda Shoe Taylor. Sorry for <laughs> saying your name incorrectly. So uh, Melinda, right now you are the showrunner for Nancy Drew, one hour drama on the CW, which is an update of the classic book series that we all know and love from our youth about a young female detective. Mm -hmm. um, but this new iteration of Nancy Drew is very modern. It's a diverse mm -hmm. world, the, you know, young, very modern characters. You have gay characters, a lot of uh, racial diversity. Mm -hmm. And I know your show also has a very diverse female heavy writing staff. Mm -hmm. So can you talk about when you were staffing your room, mm -hmm. you know, why it was important to you to have a diverse staff and how you approached mm -hmm. that as you were leading writers and hiring? Hmm. Well, first, the creator of the show, Noga Landau, specified the characters like George Fan is going to be Asian. It's in the pilot script. Nick Nickerson, Nick, Nick from the book, but they call him Nick. He's African American. It's very specifically called out so that we um, cast iconic roles with diverse people, which is kind of the way to do it. You've got to write it into the pilot script. Otherwise, you're going to, um, I can't say this for everybody, but there will be pressure to look at white people. Not that there's anything wrong with white people, but you end up you're more able to stand your ground and say, no, this person has to be Asian. That's what the script says. So that's one thing that we started with. Noga is very, very um, progressive and wonderful and truly wanted the most diverse possible room. Definitely we wanted female voices because it's a very female gaze. It was kind of originated in the Me Too era. The way that Noga constructed the pilot story in the arc of season one was very much about um, a woman who had been traumatized, you know, in a kind of Me Too situation, not to give away too many spoilers, but that was the genesis of the ghost that haunts the show. Uh -huh. And then um, when we were interviewing people, we read lots and lots of women, we read lots and lots of men. And we said, we had so many writers, we could have easily staffed two full writing rooms with people who we would have been thrilled to work with. And sometimes it was just about the chemistry of the people that we found and who was going to balance whom. We, um, we read a lot of people wanting um, just different voices, different perspectives on the world. And then when we met people, sometimes it was, it's a bit like speed dating, you know? It's <laughs> like you meet somebody and you're like, this person is somebody who is going to click with the other people we've already met. This is somebody who I feel very comfortable talking with. This is somebody who has a world experience that I don't have, so that's great. Or this is somebody who loves the books so much, you know, that was important to us. Our first question from anybody from a writer to an assistant to the production designer is, did you read Nancy Drew as a, as a kid? Did you like those books? Do you have a feeling about that character, what she does in the world, or, you know, kind of our take on her? So um, all of those things led to us finding this wonderful staff, and we're really, really fortunate to have them. The other thing that was startling to me, because it's the first time I had been the showrunner staff in this show, was how little um, final say I had. <laughs> I had a lot of input. I had a lot. I had a heavy vote, but I did not have final say in any of the hires. Fortunately. For the most part, everybody was, you know, in accord on who we liked or who the frontrunners were. 
But there were definitely people who were entering the pipeline from sources that I was unaware of, you know, executives sent people in with the agents, back when we had agents sent a lot of people in. We had a writer's build staffing boost, and, you know, several of our people came from that. Friends recommended friends. But, um, and I'm really happy with everybody we found. However, a lot of them came to me, the, you know, people I would never have thought to source out of, you know? Mm, interesting. Love that. Um, I know several people who work on your staff and they really love working oh. on the show, so. I do. <laughs> All right, thank you so much. Okay, so now we're going to pop over to Ray. So, Ray, you have spent the last several years working on another CW show called DC's Legends of Tomorrow, yes. uh, which is a sci-fi fantasy show that is wacky and wild. I know so many people are fans of this uh, show in the, in the DC TV universe. You know, your characters travel through time. They battle pirates, dragons. They fight <laughs> with a big blue stuffed animal named Bebo. Um, but amongst all this wackiness, you know, you tell stories with real heart, like a lot of those C- CW DC shows do. So can you talk about working on a show like that and how you approach meaningful storytelling amidst this, you know, fantastical environment? Maybe one example of a storyline that had real impact that you're particularly proud that your show told. Yeah, you know, it's, it's, it's interesting because I've actually worked um, with Greg Berlanti and, and the sort of the sort of super powered universe for a while. I mean, I've been on the show since the beginning. And then before that, I was on a show called The Tomorrow People. Um, and I've actually written um, scripts. I wrote a script for Flash. And I wrote a script for Supergirl. So, um, you know, one of the things that Greg had always like sort of, you know, instructed us to do in the beginning when, when we were pitching him stories was that it had to come from character. It really, you know, like you could pitch him like, oh, you know, Barry Allen's going to run for super fast and like go through this wall. And, and he would kind of just stop you and just say, like, well, you know, let, let's, let's back it up. Like, how, how does he feel? Like, what's he feeling when we open up the episode? Like, where, where does he start? You know, because we want to know where he's going to end. And, you know, and that's very much the way um, the stories are told, I think, top down in, on most of the superhero shows. Um, and especially our show. I mean, we, it is, as you said, like, it is pretty insane, the stuff that we put on the screen as far as, like, you know, evil unicorns or, like, you know, fairy godmothers who want to kill you. Um, but, you know, it all comes, ultimately, at the end of the day, it comes from a very emotional place. Like, what are the characters going through? How is this expressed in the story? Um, you know, because one of the things that we, you know, realize is, like, you know, you could really hang any sort of plot on on this emotional story as long as the emotional story makes sense. Like, if the, if, if the emotional story made sense, we could throw all sorts of craziness at it, and it, hopefully it could still hang together as long as you understood what the character was going through from beginning to end. So... That's sort of how we approach everything. I mean, everything's on a very emotional level, very human level. And like, I can't, it's hard for me to pinpoint one story exactly, but I do know, you know, starting with third season, we were very, very focused on, you know, showing a Muslim American superhero and like, you know, bringing that to life and and sort of like, you know, letting um, America see what that would look like. And we have a fantastic um, actress, Chris um, and Tally Ash, and she, you know, t- together with the writers, we've created this character who, like, you know, we 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 do our best. She, we did, we wanted to show someone who was ju- that was just part of her who she was. Like, we didn't, we never like did an, a, a Muslim American specific episode. It was just that, like something would come out, whether in dialogue or whether it was like you know, at a dinner scene. Like, we would just certain like we would just show certain things through that prism. Um, and that was really important. It was just sort of normalized. Like this is just someone who's in the community and they're not other or anything like that. Like they are very part of who we are. And, you know, that's, and that's sort of what we try to do is like, you know, our two co-captains um, on the, uh, you know, for the ship are, you know, are, are gay. Uh, and, you know, we, we never do, you know, for better, or for worse, we don't, we're not the show that does like, this is a very special episode where we, talk about gay issues like we just show it as is and them going through a normal relationship and you know they fight about their they're worried about the future they're worried about you know how they 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 view how the other person views the other so and so you know what we like to do in our show is just sort of like just show it as like a day like a slice of life so to speak you know uh, surrounded by all the insanity and, <laughs> and all that stuff, but it really is about it. Really is about the um, emotional core of, of these characters. So. I love that. I love that that way of approaching uh, representation too, which is that you don't hang a lantern on it. You just 
Yeah. Uh, just show it and normalize it as part of the universe. If you're going to normalize evil unicorns, you might have yeah. <laughs> normalize a Muslim American hero. I love it. Uh, so next, Leo and Eric, you created a superhero show of your own called Super Ninjas for Nickelodeon in 2011. And um, I it, was, it was a fantastic show. You can still watch it on, you can still uh, buy episodes on Amazon Prime and Apple TV, I believe. Um, but, you know, your representation, your commitment to representation really shows in that show because you had an Asian American lead, you had an Asian American family, so much diversity. You had a fantastic role for the great George Takei who's a friend of the theater, um, and you run a, won a Writers Guild Award for uh, Outstanding Episodic Writing. So looking back on that journey of creating that show, can you talk about some of the battles that you fought to present that diversity on screen and, you know, what battles that you think creators in television are still fighting today? Well, I don't think it was so much about battles for the representation because what we did was, like, really, because it was about ninjas and it was about that family, you already baked into... The concept, you know, what I mean, that kind of racial diversity, right? And so it was like that was fantastic. And people, um, and not just George Takei, there was also Randall Park. You know, what I mean, was the dad in our show, so he was, uh, you know, obviously tremendous to work with. Um, and Ryan Potter, um, but uh, so really baking it into like the concept is kind of really the key, you know, that keeps that in there. Um, if there's battles, it's really about kind of um, making sure that uh, we're representing accurately, you know what I mean, as real people, as real families, not having to do kind of stereotypical things. And sometimes you would get kind of, you know, perceptions from the outside of people who are not as familiar with Japanese or Asian culture would find certain things odd, you know what I mean? And then you kind of like have to explain it, what's going on kind of like outside of that, you know what I mean? So it never really, um, you know, so we don't misrepresent it. I think one of the things that we really wanted to do was to uh, sort of tell a story through a lens that you'd never seen before, especially within the superhero and the kids genre. Like typically in a lot of superhero stories, this is, uh, you know, back before the second wave of the whole Marvel thing, uh, you know, movies and also before Ray's show, you know, um, a lot of times what would happen is that people of color, uh, women were sort of regulated to sort of the sidekicks or the people being rescued. And we wanted to take all the sidekick characters of the people being rescued and turn them into the heroes. So we had like an Asian American boy as a hero. There was a black boy who was a hero. There was a girl who was a hero. And they spent a lot of time, um, I would say, rescuing um, white guys. <laughs> you know, <on> the show. <laughs> and that was sort of like the DNA of the series. You know, and I think, like Eric said, it's very important to bake it into the DNA of the series by doing a show about ninjas and having like an Asian American family at the center of it, suddenly there is a role for Randall Park and there is a role for George Takei. You know, and George always talks about how the show actually, in some weird way, um, uh, sort of elongated his career, if you will, and opened up a whole new audience for him. Because suddenly there is like a whole new generation that got to, you know, know who he is. And then they discovered uh, like Star Trek through our show, which is insane. But <laughs> that's, you know, something that happened, which is kind of cool. Um, you know, I would say as far as other challenges that are happening right now, especially in the family and kids space, uh, you know what? It's interesting. The space really uh, embraces racial diversity, I would say. Um, and people are trying to represent all types of families on screen. I think where the space um, could maybe have room for improvement is sort of in the LGBTQ community. There aren't that many characters, although there are definitely gay kids out there. Um, who need to have their stories told or at least see themselves represented in the TV show in a positive way. And not every gay story is a coming out story. I feel like um, for some reason, every gay story you watch on TV about a young person, it's about coming out. And some kids are out, you know, and what do you do about that? You know, or yeah. the coming out part might actually be they're out and there's a conflict with the family, you know, like, or a cultural conflict, you know, that's happening. So I feel like there's a lot of room to explore on those grounds. Um, we're actually work on a project right now, which actually uh, in that space that plays with some of those ideas and explores those ideas. So um, I'm excited about that. Oh, that's really I just exciting. wanted to add that, the, you know, the culture has really changed really dramatically in the past 10 years. And what, um, and this is in kind of like in our, you know, I mean, adult demographic, but as you know, when you're working in like a, a kid's area, that demographic is way ahead of you. They like their world is completely different 
than our world. So, so much of the challenge, if there is a challenge, not for just for writers, you know, of an adult age, but for the executives, is there is a change of mindset that has to happen. You know what I mean? Because it's just like, you're not looking back upon your own experiences. You know, if you're the only Asian or the only, you know, minority of any kind, you know what I mean? In a, in a different world, because, you know, um, we all live in Los Angeles here and here it is a diverse area and largely you can meet people of all different kinds. You know what I mean? But uh, the rest of the country, it has taken a little bit more time to get to that. Well, thank goodness for creators like you who are bringing those stories to life. Um, and then April. So April, you have worked on what I consider some of the most edgy, innovative half hours on TV. You know, you worked on You're the Worst for FX, which was just, you know, really sharp, really funny. And Undone on Amazon Prime, which was presented all in rotoscope animation, which I had to like relearn what that was. And, um, and now you're working on Dave on FX. So in terms of the television worlds that are, you know, th these are all TV worlds that are just really distinct in their POV, you know, is there still room for representation? Like what are some of the opportunities you found on these shows to push the boundaries? Sure. Yeah. I mean, I think like with edgier shows and the creators of these shows, they tend to want to have like a diversity of thought in the room because they really want to kind of look under the hood of major issues like, um, you know, mental illness or, or anything like that. And so they tend to hire people who uh, are different from them in terms of point of view. And I feel like in the room, we really are like stress testing every single thing that kind of comes through and just making sure like, are we, is this the best way to do this? Is this like the, the basic level way or is there a way to subvert this, et cetera. And while I feel like the shows I've been on haven't had like much on screen representation, at least in terms of Asian Americans, which, uh, you know, is annoying. <laughs> um, I feel like my voice, uh, in the room has been very much heard and well known. And I think that's huge. Um, and I am I feel like I'm given the opportunity to really present my point of view um, from, you know, like in the behind the scenes, which is just as important. I'm hoping that because I am working on such cool shows with amazing creators, that I'm like learning how to create shows like they are and then hopefully we'll be able to create my own with my distinct point of view. Um, so yeah, but that would, I, I think that would be like the opportunity. And I would also say like on Dave, we do have the opportunity now to kind of expand into the world. We have the Christine Co character, um, and we have actually four Asians in the writer's room. So amazing. It's a, I think I'm like, is this the first time there's like four Asians in like cable comedy? Like, I don't know. It's not like a show about Asians, you know, it's just, they're all amazing writers and they're there and. Um, so, but we are looking under the hood of that character to try to make her a little bit more interesting and not just make her like the kind of stereotypical Asian, but think about like, well, what is true to this character and her background? Why does she do the things that she does? And um, I think we have a real opportunity there to explore with that character. That is really cool to hear. I love that. So now the, the rest of these questions are going to be for everybody. So everyone should unmute and then just, you know, dive in whenever uh, you, you have something to say. But my first question for everyone is, what's your favorite example of representation in TV that you didn't write? Like something that's on now or something you've seen in the past that you've just loved and thought, yes, that's how you do it. I was provided with this question beforehand. Thank you, Tracy. <laughs> <laughs> yes, you're ready. Taylor Mason on Billions. Um, ah. Their pronouns are they and them. And the, act, I, the actor's name is Kate's Asia Dillon. I don't know exactly what Kate identifies with off screen, but Taylor is um, this non-binary genius, really interesting, moral compass oriented until later seasons, you know, character who's like kind of showing Damien Lewis's character what's what. And it's really a great journey to be on. And Taylor had a relationship with a guy and, um, and then a relationship with a woman. And it's just such a unique point of view as a character, but also just a, a cool storytelling engine because they're very unpredictable in a great way. So I love watching that character. I love that. Who else? Um, you know, it's, I, I, Melinda, I know you worked on, on Lost. Um, I got, you know, for me, like seeing Jen and Son's relationship on TV, oh. like, <laughs> I, I don't, it was, I didn't think it was something that was weird until I saw it. Like, oh wait, this is something we haven't quite seen before. 
you know, on a major network, maybe anywhere on TV. And it wasn't one of those things where like, I didn't think I needed until I saw it. I'm like, Oh no, I want more of this. This is great. Happy. Thank you. Yeah, no, I mean, it was just, it was not, and you have to see them in love and to see them kiss. I mean, yeah. one of these things you just don't see, you know, you see. That's exciting. Can I just, I'm going to humble brag for a second. It's not even humble. So yeah. I wrote the um, wedding vows for Son and Jim. Oh, because, man. Uh, oh. Get farmed out little snippets of things. And um, Damon yeah. Lindelof was very gracious, and they knew that I was a sucker for romance. And he was like, <laughs> just write the most bodice-ripping harlequin <laughs> It said, do, do your thing, whatever. And so <laughs> it was my great honor to come up with a couple of wedding vows. Oh, yeah. Um, oh, I love that. I love that. Yeah, they're so romantic. I mean, they are so romantic with each other. And I mean, they go through a lot, I mean, on the island. But it, is, it is such a great <laughs> relationship to watch. And, I, you know, I mean, so seeing, like, something like that, like, really it really affected me honestly more than i thought it would i didn't think it would but it, it was you know really struck me well i was on the last two seasons of the show and they had done a great job of, of you know just like making them so three-dimensional and real and, and wonderful and one of my favorite scenes on the show before i had ever gotten there was when Jin and uh, bernard are in the boat and, and Jin at that point doesn't speak much english and bernard is like had seen that he just had a big fight with son and he was like it's not easy right this thing. <laughs> yeah. I get it. You know, it had this very human moment, and yeah. I loved that. Yeah. That it was about the common experience, not about what they were different. Yeah. yeah. Exactly. Oh, exactly. that's beautiful. Yeah. You know, the show that I'm really responding to right now is uh, Pose. Um, I don't know if people have seen the show, but it's uh, it's very very well done, um, and it's a world and characters that I'm not as familiar with, um, just on a day to day level. And I love being taken into that world. Love knowing how these people think and feel and live, you know? And I think, like you said, you know, earlier, Teresa, like when you see people on television, it really humanizes them mm -hmm. and turns them into real people. And suddenly you're caring about people who are very different than yourself and getting to understand what their experience is. I think that's great. Um, it's another show that I, I just love right now is uh, Giri Haji. I don't know if you guys have seen that on Netflix. Oh my God, it's amazing. I haven't um, heard of that. It's a BBC show. It's on oh. Netflix. It's called Giri Haji. And um, it's about a Japanese detective from Tokyo who goes to London in search of a Yakuza. Who's oh actually his brother. Love and that. what is really amazing about it is that you're watching the show on the BBC and maybe about, I don't know, into the second episode or something, you realize that I would say about 90% of the show is in Japanese. And you're reading subtitles. Like the Japanese characters speak Japanese to each other when they're in London and they find other Japanese characters are speaking Japanese. And when, then when they speak English, it's only the British characters, you know, and it's really very well done. It just handles the language so well. And the people who are enjoying the show, like the fan base, they don't have a problem with it. Like nobody's like, oh, you know, you're not doing the, the normal thing of like, oh, now we have to speak in broken English to each other, though we're both <laughs> Japanese. You know? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's wonderful to hear. I'm going to have to look that up. Yeah, it's great. Um, I guess I will just add... Oh, sorry, April. Oh, sorry. Go ahead. Okay. Um, my example is a little old, but when I saw uh, that episode, Karen's episode of Master of None uh, a few years ago, I was just like, oh, okay. Like, they're representing the entitled kind of ungrateful children of immigrants. And I'm like, I see myself there. You know what I mean? Like, that's the truth it is... Our parents come from, and, and my parents, my dad are, yeah, is from Taiwan, and he had that literal story where, you know, he was like living on a farm and <laughs> had to like kill chickens and stuff. And meanwhile, I'm like, I'm too busy to hang out with you. Like that really. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I'm, yeah, that's a great I'm episode. I'm definitely feeling seen right now. <laughs> <laughs> and Eric, you were going to add one? Uh, I was just going to add, um, I really enjoy the character of Jules on Euphoria. So she's a trans uh, girl. And what I really love about her portrayal, well, I think that she's very captivating. And uh, she's just really, really great to watch. And what's so great about her performance in the show is just that it's not about her questioning her gender identity at all. It's just her being like a, a fucked up teen. You know what I mean? But at the same time, it's just like she has her her likes and her friendships and her you know teenage problems. But it's just like you are really in that life. And, uh, and I find that to be, uh, it's, it's really enjoyable and, like I said, happy. So. Oh, I love it. It's my vote. <laughs> Check out all these shows. I love it. 
So, so for someone who wants to be where you guys are now, who wants to write for television, um, I have a couple of questions about uh, breaking in. But the first question is, what, what's the first two things you think they should write? Someone brand new, wants to be a television writer. What's the, what are the first two things they should write? Huh. I would say two original pilots. Mm -hmm. yeah, that's just my opinion. But I don't read specs myself. And uh, if somebody submits a spec, I have no way of, I don't watch a lot of TV, ironically. I very rarely know whether it's a good spec or not, because I have no idea what, um, you know, name a show on TV. I don't know if you're following the format or not. I may think it's a great script, but I don't know if you're imitating the voice of the show or the structure of the show. And that's what I'm supposed to be judging if I'm reading a spec. So pilots tell you much more about a person's voice, what makes them tick, what interests them, what they want to say about the world. I like reading pilots. Yeah, I mean, it does seem like the, the bigger push is for original pilots. So, I mean, I would say at least at least one, two is probably preferable, like Melinda's saying. And I will say, though, like when I was um, an assistant, a script coordinator, a writer assistant, you know, getting out there for my first meetings, the thing that got me all my meetings was a short story, actually. Um, and it was just, it was, it was very, it was very... You, I mean, it was like, it was pretty dark and I think it got kind of grabbed people's attention. And then when they met me, they were like, oh, you're not that dark. But um, it was one of these, it was, it was sort of like, a, you know, I was like, you just don't know me that well. Um, but it was, it was a, you know, it was, it was different. I think, I think they were like, oh, it's only like 14 pages. Great. I'll read that. Um, yeah. I gave them a specific voice. It gave them a very specific atmosphere. And I, I told like a beginning, middle and end kind of story. So it was, you know, there, there was a, you know, I, I guess maybe it wasn't like an impressionistic short story. It was very narrative driven. Um, and there were some very strong characters in it. So maybe that's what they responded to. So like, you know, a lot of times I'll suggest like, you know, if you have a short or, or a one act, I wrote a couple of one acts also that, that got me some meetings, but it was really, it was really the short story. I, I would say the short story got me more meetings than anything else that I had. Wow. I wouldn't recommend that. I would say, I think it's different. I think it's a little different now. I think people want to see pilots yeah. more often now, but I think if you have something that you think is really representative of your voice, um, I think it's worth throwing in the pile or talking to your agent about it or whoever wants, you know, because you never know who will want to read it and they may bring you in just to, just because they, you wrote it and they think it's cool. You know? That's very cool. How about the rest of you? Does, does anyone vote for spec? Well, uh, I, I would actually say, I mean, if this is for someone who's like brand new to the genre, um, and I agree with both Melinda and Ray that like people only want to read pilots now, but if you're breaking into the genre and you're just starting out, like, as an exercise, write a bunch of spec episodes of TV, even if nobody ends reading them, because um, when you get that job on staff, that is your literal job. Like you're gonna be sent off to write an episode in the voice of these characters. Mm -hmm. And I think like for me, even though none of the specs I've ever written had gotten me any gigs per se, um, you know, they gave me the confidence that I could A, write in someone else's voice and really capture the characters and B, like write something very, very fast. Like I would recommend not spending more than a couple weeks maybe writing uh, a stuck episode or something. Mm -hmm. Just to, you know, put yourself under the gun and, and really feel like what it's like to be on staff. Yeah. Uh, but I would agree with both Ray and Melinda that like, you know, the other thing you should be working on is the thing that's voicey and is personal to you in some way. Mm -hmm. I would add um, just, uh, I'm agreeing with everybody and what everybody has said so far, but just another um, vote for in the spec department. Like if you're interested in applying to writing programs, like diversity writing programs at the different studios and stuff, uh, some of them will accept original pilots and they will only accept specs. And I think that's largely due to legal reasons. Um, so if you don't have a spec, you can't really end up applying, um, but you will probably need an original pilot later because that's what you're gonna end up rewriting for the program. Yeah. So a lot of times they will read the spec first and then ask for a pilot or, uh, you know, that happens. I would also say just on the comedy side of things, um, you know, most comedies uh, sort of fall in one into three, one of three categories. So I would write a comedy that's either a family comedy, a workplace comedy, or a single person dating comedy. Because <laughs> um, those are sort of the three genres for most of them. Um, yeah. Single person dating. So just make sure that's what you're doing because that will help you get one of those three sort of jobs. Yeah. yeah, Leo and I have actually had a, a good opportunity to teach a bunch of classes and be guest speakers at like, you know, Northwestern or Hawaii and things like that. And uh, I think, you know, when people are considering a career, you know, I mean, I think it's really important that they write something that can fit into something that isn't existing. Um, 
TV uh, show, you know what I mean? Whether it's a genre one hour, whether it's these three types of comedies and things like that. So I think that's very important. And I guess uh, the other thing is just to make whatever it is to be just like kind of exceedingly clear. Because I feel like early student, early writers try to be too artistic and to be like, you know, or it's like, you know, they, they're really trying to be very unique. And of course, we really, really want unique voices, but not that many unique voices, to be honest. I mean, it is television. You know what I mean? It is something that is a, a broadcast medium. You know what I mean? And like the narrow your story gets or the, the more narrow that gets, like the smaller the audience. Now, I, I think that, you know, that's, you know, I agree with what everyone else has said, but at the same time, it's like, there's this balance and it depends on who your community is a little bit. Because if you write something that's commercial and your community is indie film, forget it. You know what I mean? It's like, they, they're like, they're going to be like, you're not creative, you're not this or that, you're right. But if you know people who are, I think, more in the business and who have an established, uh, you know, studio television, then they will understand those kind of more marketable things easier or first, you know what I mean, for, for edit this part, because I'm trained. <laughs> <laughs> That's great advice. I, I, so keep, yeah. keeping with that theme of advice for new writers, you know, when you guys mentor writers or teach writers, what's, what's, what are some of the common things that you tell them to do in crafting original pilot concepts? Cut um, pages. What is that? Cut 10 pages. Cut 10 pages. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. Totally. Exactly. Yeah. Good. I mean, yeah. I have a script that's 68 pages long. I just like, oh, Jesus. Oh, yeah. <laughs> like, <is there> any- <laughs> I also Get to it. Like, Get to it. Yeah. My, uh, my mentee at Cape, actually, who's terrific, Nick, um, I was like, I love this script. And if you, you just have to tell yourself, Somebody's going to give me $5 million to greenlight this pilot if I can get the next four pages up. I promise you, you will find four pages up. <laughs> 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 right. And it's great. Yeah. It's much better. Uh, you know, it was already a great script because it was so specific. That's another uh, piece of advice I would give is that his script was about um, – it it's so specific that I don't want to tell you because I don't want anybody to steal his idea. But it was about a historical figure, but through the point of view of that person's spouse. And investigating kind of a, you know, almost a supernatural aspect to this person who you didn't really realize it was there before. It was really cool. So um, he had done so much research and had kind of affinity for that particular world and had worked in that world before. So he was able to do all of these things in the script that it was just like, oh, more of that, more of the, you know, the kind of inner workings of that world. But also, you know, make this act out come sooner. Do this flashback shorter. Do this thing, you know, so structurally I was able to help him, I think, get it a little more um, pacey, basically. Because the other thing I would do as a piece of advice is to have great act-outs. Mm. You don't want mm. any reason to stop scrolling their media. They must keep going. Yeah. <laughs> That's great. That makes sense. Other advice? Uh, we have a fallacy that kind of uh, bugs us a lot. And, you know, I mean, I think that there's lots of fallacies that a young writer is going to hear from, like, different amounts of people, different people. You have to find a way to sort through them. And one of the fallacies that, uh, that we uh, kind of hate is uh, show, don't tell. <laughs> and it seems like so ridiculous because so, so many times it's just like, you know, a character, what they want is just, just tell me the background of this thing, uh, of this character in, these, in this line or two. You know what I mean? When I think as a, a young writer, you're just like, oh, how do I show? I'm going to like, you know, have all this description of showing how this person is like really neurotic or, Whatever, whatever that background is, sometimes you can just get to it much more, much quicker, quicker, quicker. <laughs> quicker. That's a word. Quicker, much quicker. quicker. Use a spell check. Use a spell check. <laughs> okay. That's the other one. Okay. No, but it's true. I feel like if it's shootable or actable, you can write it into the description of your script. Mm-hmm. You know, because a lot of times in the show, don't tell. I think people get lost. Like you'll end up writing this character, and people are like, I don't understand this character. When all you need to do is writing the description, um, this character has autism. And some of yeah. people are like, oh, oh, okay, great. Now I can follow it. You know, yeah. it's like, I think a lot of times people need to be told. I think, you know, that uh, when people are reading, they're reading on their iPad in the backyard or on the Stairmaster or on the toilet, you know, <laughs> and like, that's where your work is being judged, you know, and so they are kind of scrolling through kind of quickly. So they need to be able to get it quickly. And sometimes you just have to tell them. 
I, I tell this to my students because it goes in hand in hand with what Melinda said. I, I say television you, is has to be efficient because you have to cram so much story into your page count. So what goes with that is embracing exposition because television is has a lot more exposition and, and you're going to have to tell more than you show just to be efficient with your storytelling. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. That is a hard thing. You're constantly being asked to recap where your two characters are and why they're doing this thing together. And yet it's also supposed to be bantery and <laughs> right. it's been yeah. like yeah. the page to get that plus the new mission. <laughs> yes. Mm -hmm. yeah. And feel organic and have a joke. And yeah. Yeah. Uh, there's a, a lot of times like the, you know, newer writers will, will come to me and they'll say, look, I've got this idea for this and I've got a script idea for this. Like, I don't know which one I want to go with. And what I always tell them because, and I always say this because this has worked, has worked for me in the past. Um, is that like, which is the one you want to write? Like which one do you feel compelled to write? Because I've tried to <laughs> write stuff like on the advice of, you know, my reps or whoever mm -hmm. it is like, you really yeah, need this yeah. kind of sample. And I'm like, mm -hmm. okay, yeah, that's right. Yeah. This is what I need. It's not, I need to fill it in my, my oeuvre or whatever. <laughs> and so I'll try to write that thing. And I just, it's not, and I spent like a year and a half on this one script <gasps> went nowhere. Like it literally, I will never show it to anyone. It's like 58, <laughs> pages of garbage you know it probably started at 68 and i cut 10 pages just like melinda said it was still garbage um but yeah i mean i guess i just say like what do you what do you want to write which one do you want to write because i feel like once you decide that if you want to write it you'll you'll put the time and effort into making it good you put the time and effort into sacrificing your weekends and sacrificing time with your friends to actually do it because if you're not into it mm. it's just going to be a hot piece of mess you know you know, and if you're not into it, no one else will be on. No one else will be in it. And it shows, yeah. yeah. No, totally. For sure. April, did you want to add something to that? Um, I always told people, you know, you gotta, you have to do a lot of work to find out what resonates with you because this is going to be the well that you're going to be drawing on basically for your entire life. So it's like constantly really tuning into yourself and being like, well, what are the things that I think about at night? What are the things that make me cry? What are the things that I'm terrified of? What are the things that like, I don't want to feel like I don't even want to like feel it. And I guess some of this goes along the lines of like self work kind of self analysis. But I, I just find that like, when you can just tune into that and stick a straw in that all of a sudden, brainstorming ideas becomes super easy because you don't always find some kind of plot or world or concept or kind of fit whatever you're trying to say but finding that is like the key for me because once you have that you actually know what everything is actually about and then you can you know create all your characters to resonate with that like yeah. feeling or theme or whatever yeah i think that's great advice i remember having one afternoon when i was feeling particularly kind of burnt out this was like with my broken struggling very long period but i had to like sit down like take a day off and go to the beach and write down like what are the things that I used to enjoy reading? Like why did I want to be a writer? You know, because I was like so struggling and, and broke and feeling discouraged that and that was showing up the work because the work was becoming very like um, forced, you know? And I was like, Oh wait, I responded to the sense of adventure in this one. I responded to the feeling of kind of Cinderella, but she's also a badass warrior in this one. I responded to escapism in this one, you know, and then I started to like look for ways to either put that in the current piece of writing or make something that was about those feelings and how to get to those feelings through the journey of the character. Oh, I love that. So kind of uh, evolving from that, thinking about your individual uh, writing journeys, you know, from when you started trying to write pilots, trying to write specs to where you are now, when you look at that journey, like what's the, what's the biggest thing that you do in your writing all the time now that you know you didn't there. Like what's the, what's the biggest sort of shift in technique um, that now is come second nature to you? Second nature. I think I, <laughs> I see myself in the editing suite with eight minutes to cut out everything that must be delivered at no more than 42 minutes. <laughs> and, uh, and I think about like, well, this will cut into the scene here. We're never going to go to this monologue. We're going to, you know, this is um, this is going to be. I also think about the production side of it, kind of like if we want to ask a bunch of day players to, to perform this ceremony that we're just inventing. This is going to look terrible. We're never going to get this done, and it's also going to be like it's extraneous. It doesn't mean anything. We should cut from this thing to the phone ringing. 
who cares what's going on in the background? I'm going to make that cut in the editing room. Let's do it on the page. <laughs> Saying, yeah. Hmm. You know, I, I guess. I, oh, go ahead. Sorry. I was going to say, I think one of the things that I ended up doing more is um, trusting myself more and knowing, you know, when, you know, I like, because I'm kind of like an intuitive writer and I like to feel my way through. Um, I know that doesn't actually help Leo so much. Um, <laughs> Leo is actually pretty good at kind of deciphering what I'm feeling. So, uh, but I, I do really think it's a lot about trust and knowing that you can just get through these stories and also just that you can make it, that you can make it great and unique. You know what I mean? And the more you trust yourself, because I love, I really love what, what April, you, what you were saying, because, you know, you, it is knowing yourself and what you tap into, you know what I mean? That, that is your, your well for everything. And so knowing that you can always go back to yourself knows that you can kind of like complete something and, and make, make it an impactful story. Oh, I love that. Um, I was thinking, like, you know, there's, I don't know how to, I, you know, it's weird. It's, I love this question because it's something I had never quite thought of before. But um, I know when I used to write, there used to be like a cool shit method, right? It was like, okay, when this cool thing happened in this cool room, <laughs> and, like, and then like, you know, like, and then, it, you know, they'd say this cool dialogue and that would just be a great scene, right? And then I think, you know, when you, I think this really helped when I started getting on set. And you start realizing, like, oh no, actually, these scenes need a POV because the actor will be like, whose scene is like, you know, who, who am I supposed to be talking to? I think once I went away from cool shit to like POV of the scene, like whose scene is it? Why are they there? You know, you know, and and, and realizing like that's what makes it cool is like coming at it from a character's point of view, like whose POV of the scene. And you know, a lot of times, um, you know, and this is something. This is why I laughed earlier because this is something I constantly struggle with. Is like whose POV of the scene is this? Because that will help you design the scene, A, it, it, so that's, that it's shootable, right? Uh, and number two, like that it, you, you, you lose less of it in the editing because you've shot it and wrote it in a certain way that will hopefully survive the cut, you know? Um, and that is, that's sort of what I've learned, you know, from moving from cool shit to <laughs> POV. I don't really know how else to say. To POV, so, but then get, in order to get to the cool shit. So it's, in order to, yeah, it kind yeah. of goes back. And then you end up with cool shit all over again. Yeah. I love it. <laughs> um, I'll add that, like, one of the major things that I've kind of learned now is, and this kind of has to do with what Ray's talking about, is that every single character in your story, like you as the author need to know what their emotional journey is, what they each want, even if they're like super minor characters, and you have to be able to track this over time, because especially in television, when you intersect with them again, the other characters while they're off screen are obviously still doing things. They're not like living in a vacuum of well, the only times they appear on TV. And I think just knowing that helps like create richer characters, uh, constellations of your cast. So it's not just like a singular thing and then all this confetti that's there to serve as the one, mm -hmm. one character. So that was like a huge thing for me to learn because I think oftentimes when we start writing, we're like, the main character is me and I know all about that journey and then everybody else is just there to help me along. <laughs> <laughs> you have to know like everybody, like what, what makes them all tick, you know, get to know them as well as all the characters. So let's move from creating your original stories to being on a television writing staff. Because being on a staff is a particularly uh, intense collaborative experience. You know, you want to make your voice heard as an individual writer, contribute in a meaningful way. But you, like someone mentioned earlier, you're there to serve the showrunner's vision of the show. You're there to be a team player, be additive and supportive. Um, so what are some of the biggest lessons that you've all taken from being a member of a staff and collaborating with other writers? Uh, I would say, I think, once again, I, I, I feel like we, we're always like this, like we always take these fallacies and then say, break them apart and say they're not true. I feel like there's this terrible thing that's going around where they say like, first time staff writers shouldn't speak in writer's rooms. Yes. And I don't know who is spreading that around, but I think it's really, really untrue and really detrimental to staff writers. Yeah. Um, especially, uh, you know, female and um, the IPOC staff writers, you know, because what happens is like you're seen as somebody who doesn't contribute, you're too quiet, and then you don't get your option picked up, and then you're out of a job, right? Yeah. Like you have to talk and contribute to the writer's room, but you shouldn't dominate. 
And so what I always tell people is that you should speak once every 20 minutes. Like if you don't know, like speak once every 20 minutes. That turns out to be three times an hour. That makes what you say thoughtful and contributive. Um, but it's not so much that other people can't talk and it's not too little so that it's like you're not there. <laughs> That's great. It's a good estimate, yeah. 20 to 30 minutes. <laughs> <laughs> but I totally agree that you must speak up. I'm only half joking. I totally <laughs> agree that you must speak up because otherwise you do start to um, fade into the wallpaper and that's not what you're there for. First of all, they hired you because they want to hear your voice. And if they were forced to hire you, then this is your opportunity to prove that they made the right decision despite their, you know, mm -hmm. inclinations. And uh, that's depressing. That they're I have heard that before also. Yeah. I think a piece of advice that I would tell my younger self is don't take it so personally. None of it, you know? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Every day in the room with my first job was really traumatizing. <laughs> <laughs> but I, you know, I have matured as a person since then. But, um, you know, some of these rooms, are like ice skating and people are taking turns and some of the rooms are like roller derby. <laughs> you know, you gotta be ready and and also not take it to heart and feel like you're a terrible writer or not a good person or no fun or people don't think you're cool. If your like idea gets shot down or if the showrunner is in a bad day, having a bad day or too busy or you know, it's almost never about you. If it is about you, then it's too late anyway. So, <laughs> so, also, so <laughs> Second piece of that advice, in addition to not taking it personally, is to have like a really good sense of who you are, as opposed to the who the writer is or what the work is doing or how the network received your latest script or your latest outline. Because if you make the two things the same, my work and myself, that way lies madness. I mean, I've gone down that way, especially yeah. doing some of my initial notes. Where I was like, oh, I'm reading a show and every round of notes, I have to take everybody's notes. And then if the studio disagrees with the pod and the network disagrees with the studio, I haven't done my job right, and nobody's going to see that I'm a failure. <laughs> you know, it's just like, all these things go through your head, and none of that helps the writing, okay? And also, it's not true. You know, you're there to kind of like, you're the person who actually knows how to write these scripts. I think that gets lost very quickly in the pilot process. You really forget that you're the person who got hired and paid a bunch of money because you have experience and talent. And it's very easy to forget that, or at least it was for me because of, you know, low self-worth, I guess. I've, I've all passed that. But my <laughs> first pilot, I was just like, oh, God, they must know. They, they write all, the, they make all these shows. I, I should definitely eliminate the thing that I thought was interesting about the character to begin with. I should definitely already make her, uh, you know, pro in her job instead of having her discover this line of work because of an interesting incident that I thought of and a better way to get into the script. So I've never pushed back on any of the notes. So that's another that's another thing, actually, to go back to the other question that I do now that I didn't do when I was starting out. Well, I'll, I have a different title now, but when I was first starting out, it, if, if somebody told me to do something, I immediately did it, didn't ask any questions, didn't even ask for clarification. I just did it like, I think I understood what they said, so let me go parrot that. <laughs> so um, it's really important even as a staff writer to say, let me just say this back to you. So what you want here is, she still needs to reject her at the end of the scene, but at the beginning of it, I want to understand more what it's going to mean to the character when she gets rejected. I need to set that up. So what you're saying, actually, is I need to set it up in Act 1. You know, like, if you can ask that kind of question, it's going to be much more helpful than just running off and, and doing the thing that you think will lead everybody around you, which is a whole other panel. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. All right, April and Ray, advice yeah, for um, staff. Mine is a little bit more, like, spiritual, I guess. Um, but I would say like one of the big things is to kind of go in letting go of this good student, like achievement mentality, because I think you were so focused on like, how many things am I getting on the board? Or like, do you like that? Or do you not like that? You're not actually <laughs> being present and contributing. And I think presence is like the most, most, most important thing when you're in a writer's room at any level. You know, I think presence is sometimes even more important than like preparedness because sometimes if you're sitting there with your like, I did my homework, I did 20 ideas last night and I'm ready. You're not listening to what's actually happening in the room. You're not creating that space for like organic creativity to flow. And some of my best pitches have just kind of come in the moment, you know, and I've had to just ignore. I'm like, all right, well, this does not apply anymore, <laughs> yeah. um, you know, but I'm happy because I'm like, oh, I'm actually contributing to something that's happening in the present moment, not something that I was thinking about, like, before the room started. And he's like, okay. uh, that's such good advice. That was a big lesson I learned when I did the Cape Fellowship of 
letting go of that overachieving Asian American identity that had, I think so many Asian American writers, we come from those backgrounds where, you know, we learned there was a way to do it right, which was to get straight A's and win the awards. And like television, uh, television writers room was a whole different beast than that. Yeah, no, I mean, there's all, I, I mean, in general, I, I think they go along with what April is saying, like there's a lot of letting go of stuff. Um, you know, mental health wise, I mean, just to, to <laughs> um, a lot of it is like, you know, don't take a lot of stuff personally, especially when your ideas are getting constantly shot down. I mean, you know, um, you got to keep pitching and, and, you know, people are just, you know, it, it's just going to be hard to, you know, if you feel like your voice is not being heard, then, you know, just keep pitching. It's really, you have to let that go. Cause I know, I know when, and I still do this, like even every now and then, like I mean, someone will just be like, no, that's not where we're doing right. And I'll be like, you know, and I'll get all grumpy for like, <laughs> half an hour, but I got to remember what Leo's saying and make sure I speak up for, you know, the next time. <laughs> but I would think, you know, one of the hardest things, and it, and it, and I think this is what the hardest thing I've been dealing with is that like when the story is just not going in a direction you agree with at all, for whatever reason, it's hard, you know, you don't want to be the person that's always like, this is not right. I think we should do this instead. Like you don't want to be that person. I mean, everyone else is on board. There's a reason for it. There's a vision for it that even though you don't see, doesn't mean that it's wrong. I mean, there's a thousand ways to tell a story, right? So I think at a certain point you let go like, okay, well, I don't agree with this, but if we're going to tell this version, let's do this, or let's put this bow on it, or let's comb the hair this way. You know, you're like putting, you're, you're just trying to make it um, as good as possible, even if you don't agree with like that version of the story. I think at a certain point as a writer on staff, I think right. you are supposed to just like support it and be the cheerleader. It's like cheerleading, you know, being a cheerleader, you know, being a fan of your like, favorite team even though they're not that great you know that kind of thing it's like you just cheer them on you're like okay let's do it let's hope for the best you know um that can be hard i mean that can be hard when you see it when you're like oh i don't because like i will say that like most of the time almost i would say 98 percent of the time even though i didn't agree with it it turned out great it really did yeah. it turned out amazing and better than i thought because it was a, an avenue that was pursued that i wouldn't have thought of myself you know what i mean and that's why I think that's the beauty of being on staff is that you have all these ideas and you don't agree with them a lot of the times, honestly. But the end product, everyone is trying to make something amazing. Something sometimes something amazing happens anyway. You know what I mean? Like, <laughs> so uh, that's you know that's sort of my lesson over the years of just seeing all these you know seeing my path in the room. I love that. Something amazing happens despite all the idiots you're working. <laughs> 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 the, the idiots that might be watching no <laughs> um so uh so this is a particularly um emotional time for the country it's a particularly challenging time for the country and a variety of reasons and we're, i think we're all seeing in hollywood a particular awakening and growing awareness of not only the responsibility but the opportunity that television has to um push the boundaries of representation and, you know, create sh social change. And networks and studios are, are, are finally sort of like getting on board to, you know, a lot of the themes and, and things we've all been living with in terms of, you know, showing representation. They're finally getting on board and trying to, trying to do it better. You know, they're trying to uh, tell stories that represent under uh, represented voices better, that can humanize them more, integrate them more into main casts. Um, rather than keeping them as the sidekick or the other. So what advice do all of you have for Hollywood as they're trying to do it better now? Oh. So for Hollywood, just for... Yeah, for <laughs> networks, studios, decision makers, you know, the producers, the people who are, you know, because we've all been living with this, you know, from this place of belief. But it's like, uh, I think there's a lot of networks and studios that are going to be reaching out to creators of color, kind of like, help us figure this out. Mm -hmm. what, what advice do you have for them? Uh, I feel like it's not just enough to have like the creative, you know, uh, creatives of color. I mean, we really need like executives and producers of color too, because it's really throughout the whole industry. Because like, you know, you can't, you know, when you walk into those networks and the majority of it is, you know, one demographic of people, you know what I mean? You're going to get their thought, you know what I mean? How they see the world, you know what I mean? And that is like, you know, whenever I enter a, uh, an environment like that, it's like, it's weird because it's not natural. You know what I mean? It's not natural to life in LA. So it's like, and until it's kind of pervasive, 
Um, you know what I mean? So we just need to get more people, you know, of color in those executive and producer roles just as much as the writer's roles. I mean, just adding to that, I feel like, you know, change comes from the people who create content and also from like the gatekeepers and decision makers. And I think to Eric's point, you know, what's very interesting is on the studio side and on the network side, there is a generally a type of person there who's in charge, who's the decision maker. And so if you're pitching stories as like a creator um, of color or a diverse creator, um, and you're pitching it to somebody who does not share your experience or understand your experience, it might be very hard for them to buy your experience and develop it into a television show or to give you notes that um, make sense, you know, into what you're trying to create. You know, so I feel like there's sort of a systematic uh, problem there. Um, I think there needs to be a lot more hiring of like the diverse executives um, just across the board. Um, I, there's also this thing that happens in the studios, and I don't know if it's a true nitty gritty, but I'll get into it. Like there are lists, like everybody on this, you know, this uh, panel is on a list in a studio and we're all like uh, hopefully approved on the approved list, but there are people on the unapproved list as well. You know, and these decisions are made, and um, it's a systematic approach to like the writers and the people coming in and out of the system, but the system is broken. So there's a lot of writers who are diverse writers who are very good who are not in the system and not on the list, or for some reason they were not approved for something, you know, and then end up on the unapproved list and they're essentially unhirable. So there's sort of this weird thing that happens, and then you have to think about who's actually keeping and making the list and why did somebody's work not speak to somebody. You know, because they maybe didn't understand it or was coming from a, a specific cultural point of view that didn't resonate with them. So they're like, oh, this person doesn't know characters. Or like, my family doesn't talk like that. They don't know how to write families. And so they put them on the don't hire list. You know, like, there's, there's something broken there. But I would say on the content creator side, we also need to look at our writer's guild. Um, I'm going to be a little critical of the guild right this second, which is, I guess, okay, because I don't know. We'll see what happens. <laughs> we can but, it out. But you know, like I, I guess we're talking about other people getting their houses in order, but I think we as writers have to get our own house in order first. And I think we have to show that we not only embrace diversity, but the writers guild it needs to be an anti racist organization. Mm -hmm. I think everybody in the writers guild a guild needs to go through um, anti-racism training, especially the showrunners and the leaders <laughs> in the guild. Like uh, and likewise on the studio side and the network side. Yeah. I agree with mm -hmm. all that. I, I would say, if I could, to studios and networks, create some kind of funding to support the, a support staff, literally. You know, it's kind of like the feeder pool of the talent, and there are a lot of, I mean, you've read the Vanity Fair article, uh, perhaps, where it's the kind of living wage that people were barely making it in Hollywood because they had overtime and mileage and lunches and snacks and office supplies and internet. You know, all of that's gone. And people are wanting to cap the hours. My assistants can't get overtime on the weekend. And, you know, or it would be an uphill struggle. I mean, I had, um, well, I, not to talk out of school. Anyway, it's, it's a bigger deal to ask for overtime now. And uh, not impossible, but a bigger deal. And it's kind of like people who don't have money coming in from other sources like family or, you know, wherever they have money coming in from, they're really getting going to get squeezed out of the business. It's, <laughs> Because, I mean, there's a like, huge economic thing happening. It's not just Hollywood, like, for us, you know. But but folks who were struggling beforehand are really struggling now. And, uh, you know, a lot of folks are probably not going to be able to eke it out on lunches and mileage anymore because those things have vanished. Yeah. So I think that yeah. it's really important for the studios and the networks to recognize that when you are coming up through the assistant ranks, in the support staff, in the bullpen, you know, some writer's rooms, Nancy Drew does this, you know, we encourage the assistant to pitch. They see the process, they see the politics. I consider us not to get political room, but I certainly have seen other rooms that were political, and I saw the assistants learn to navigate that as well, and that's a critical skill. Actually, we didn't even talk about that. Where, <laughs> that's another battle. <laughs> every, every show is very different, but some shows are more um, more minefields than others, and if you don't understand that, that's, all, that's a huge hurdle to your advancement. And then, um, you know, meanwhile, I also think, like you're saying, the showrunner training and, and all of that, it would also help to, to train them in just kind of like how to be good managers, a lot of showrunners, you know, beyond the racism thing, beyond misogyny, beyond kind of like elitism, some people just aren't good at communicating. Mm -hmm. you know, or kind of like yeah. being transparent yeah. about where they are in the decision process or not making people feel like, there's a book I would recommend to every showrunner and every executive actually called Payoff by Dan Ariely. Uh -huh. It's about the science of human behavior and motivation. 
and how to keep, keep people like engaged in what they're doing. He did this experiment where he had people come in and it was like a room with test subjects and a guy at the, the desk. And the first part of the exercise was, well, you fill out this very simple worksheet, like circle things, whatever, put your name at the top, and then you hand it in, you get a dollar. So the first group of subjects, they start handing in their papers. The guy looks at their name, scans all the way down to see that they've completed the worksheet, says, uh-huh. And, you know, says, do you want to do another one of these for 95 cents? And they're like, sure. You know, so they keep doing it. Goes to about 15 cents that they, you know, declining wages. They're like, yeah, I've got enough. I've done enough of these. Second group, he doesn't look at the name. And he just turns it over on a pile, doesn't check to see that they've done it or not at all, doesn't make eye contact, and says, do you want to do another one for 95 cents? And this group, their interest plummets. Third group, my favorite group, they hand in their worksheet with their name on it, fully filled out. He puts it into a paper shredder while <laughs> I'm looking at it and saying, do you want to do another one for 95 cents? This group all plummets. But their plummeting rate, paper shredder group, almost the same as people who were not thanked. Wow. <laughs> Amazing. Not even thanked effusively, not even acknowledged. Not even oh. like, I saw your name, I saw you did the thing I asked you to do. Those people, it's like you're tearing up their work. Wow, what a metaphor. I know. It's a great, it's a great book. That's what um, writing in Hollywood is like. <laughs> it is. Exactly. Totally. I mean, the number of times I've turned in a draft that I like slaved over, lost sleep over, you know, cried in my tea over, and then, you know, it just vanishes. Four days later, a different script comes out with my name on it, <laughs> which I have to defend to the actors. Yeah. I don't like the, the lines or the act, or you know, and no one ever tells me what went wrong. <laughs> yeah. Wow. Yes. Yeah. Communication yeah. is so key because it's, some of these TV seasons are long and that's, if that's the first episode of a 22 yeah. episode order that, that, that someone is yeah. feeling that way. It's just yeah. going to snowball. I know. And it's, it's not even like, Oh, I, I feel bad. I didn't hit the mark, but please tell me how I can do it better for you. Yeah. Now. Mm -hmm. I mean, the last four days weren't any fun for you either. You know? <laughs> yeah. So, anyway. My goodness. Yeah. Um, I, I just want to add about the executive thing. Um, and I think totally hiring executives of color to represent all of us is super important. But I think the other big thing for other execs, like higher ups, to really understand is that you don't just hire people of color, you have to actually give them a space to actually succeed. And I think a lot of times, especially in studios and networks, there's this like culture of fear or something where low, junior execs or middle mid-level execs aren't given the kind of creative freedom to just go with their gut and be like, I want to take a chance on this show and I don't like my job is not on the line if this thing fails. Cause I think a lot of times they don't want to take risks on things or trust their own gut because they're like, well, I have to make sure the upper level people who are probably all generally white dudes, <laughs> um, you know, as long as, you know, they, they need to like what I bring them or it needs to be super successful. Otherwise I'm going to lose my job. But that's not going to be helpful for anybody, you know. So that's kind of, I, I don't have any answers for that. I just hope that, uh, you know, people will recognize that the, the safe space thing, the, like setting up for success is, is just as important as the hiring itself. Yeah, I mean, I, I think, like, jumping on what you guys are all saying, I mean, it, it, there's a lot of um, fear from, like, the executive side. And this goes to, like, Leo's list thing, too, and... and um, you know, there are these lists like you're talking about and, you know, every time you try to bring up something that's different from the list, whether it's like, you know, we need more women on the list, they'll just say like, well, these are the, we only have two women on the list and that's all you would get. Like, no, there's more, add more or open the list up or throw the list out. Like, why are we looking at the same list? Like, you know, it's, it's weird. It's like, it, I, I think, I think there's a lot of, you know, my advice in general to executives would be like, you know, listen to the showrunners, listen to what we, what they want. Like we're trying to, we want diverse writers and, we, and actors and directors, and we need to open up that process because it's been closed for so long. Yeah. I mean, look, in TV, it's gotten, gotten a lot better. You know, I mean, even in my time in television, it just, it, in 10 years, it's just completely, the landscape looks different and, you know, and so change is happening, but I think it is like, you know, the executives need to, I think the executives just started listening, you know, and it, it's gotten better, but it's, it, it, there's a lot more room to improve. You know? I think that's the most important shift 
in Hollywood and in the country is understanding how many of these problems are systemic. They're, they're rooted in the institution as opposed to being a problem person or a particular network. And it's like, we need to look a lot deeper than we've been looking for, mm-hmm. for the answers and for the problems that have created, you know, for the things that have created these problems, you know, that it's a lot more deep, deeply rooted than anyone before was uh, willing to admit. But now we're all on the same page about that. Um, Thank you so much, everyone, for this conversation. This has been really honest and really, really um, uh, uh, compelling. And I feel like people have gotten really great advice. I'm just going to wrap up on a, a happier note, which <laughs> is that other than your, your shows, obviously, all of your shows, uh, what do you think people should be watching right now? Recommendations for TV to binge as we are all staying safe at home. Hamilton. Yes. Excuse <laughs> me, haven't seen really? it. Literally yeah. the only thing I've been watching. Like, <laughs> oh, right. I've been watching it on Endless Loop. Like, somebody send help, please. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, it's good. Here. Uh, there's a fantastic documentary called Disclosure. Have you guys seen it on Netflix? Uh-huh. Oh, it's so good. You should see it. I kind of recommend it. Um, it's about the trans representation in media, you know, kind of forever. And it points out such basic things that I didn't think about. Like, after the crying game, there came this long list or, you know, just like many, many comedic bits where when a guy finds out that a trans woman is anatomically a man, he throws up and it becomes this big thing in like Jim Carrey's um, Ace Ventura. I was just horrified watching it because I, I saw that like many, many years ago and didn't really, I was like, oh, that's kind of mean and, and, you know, like whatever they're doing. But I didn't think about it like, oh, what if you're a trans woman? And you're thinking, is that what people think of, you know, hmm. and things like the trans person who ends up as a murder victim. And it's always because, oh, the person they were with is so horrified and disgusted that they found out that this anatomical person is not who they thought they were, that they instantly murdered them in a fit of violence and revolt. Mm. You know? Like, what does that do to some... And I, I really didn't think about it. I was rather ashamed that I hadn't thought about these things. It's also a terrific documentary, just no matter what your kind of, like, level of awareness of it. It's really well done. Lots and lots of interviews, lots of great clips, lots of stuff proposed, actually. And um, just really, really compelling kind of crafting of the documentary journey. I highly recommend that. Oh, yeah. I love that. It's a great documentary. I mean, just to, uh, to talk about it a little, a little bit longer, um, you know, you can extrapolate what they're talking about uh, with trans people to, like, uh, any other group that's underrepresented. So one of the major points um, in the documentary is, like, you know, in the general public, their only knowledge of a transgender person is something they see in the media, whether it's a TV show or a movie, right? And that's the only, and so they assume that that's what they're all like or whatever. And you can extrapolate that to like any sort of underrepresented group like Asians or Latinos or blacks, right? Like you could, you're like, oh, I don't know any Asians, but they all must like, you know, like all go to Chinese, you know, like they all like celebrate, uh, you know, Christmas at their Chinese restaurant or whatever. You know what I mean? It's like, you know, it's like if you don't know any Asians, like all you see is is long, long, long duck dong and sixteen candles. You know what I mean? It's like yeah. it's weird. It's like, so you can extrapolate what they're saying, which I think is a really interesting thing about the documentary about representation in the media and how it affects everyone. Mm-hmm. It's great. I'm really excited to see that because it's like you know our entire culture has a lot of bias, and it's like you know every one of us is kind of you know kind of a victim, but we also perpetuate it. You know, and the whole Black Lives Matter is just like you know has been kind of a great awakening for everybody who chooses to step through that door. You know what I mean? So we haven't been watching so much, you know, more. We've been watching a ton of other shows, but like things like the uh, PBS uh, about the uh, restoration, what's not the restoration, the uh, uh, reconstruction, reconstruction after the Civil War. And it's just like, if you haven't seen it, just one hour of that first documentary, it just will blow your mind about how all these things have been constructed and then we believe it. You know what I mean? This is like, a, it's like, you know, I keep saying to all my family, it's like, this is an Orwellian society that we're living in. We are told, you know what I mean? Black people are bad. You know what I mean? We are told like, you know, like trans people, you can't, you know, you, you should throw up if you, if you have sex with one, you know what I mean? It's just like all these kind of weird reactionary things. And, uh, and I think it's incumbent upon us as storytellers when we create um, characters, you know what I mean, to, I guess, bring that humanity back, you know what I mean, and really understand where all these biases are, are coming from. Um, it's probably some, one of the 
the best things that we could possibly do to change culture in a positive way. Mm -hmm. I love that. Um, I just watched this documentary that I loved uh, as well about Yayoi Kusama on Hulu. It's called Infinity, I think. Oh, it's no, just, yes. Oh, yes. yes. I saw it. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Very inspirational about, like, you know, just cre creation and staying authentic to your voice and your vision and mm -hmm. resilience that she, she has is incredible. And I, I don't know. I watched it and I just was like, no, I feel inspired again. <laughs> <laughs> That's cool. Right. I love that. Well, on that note of inspiration, I'm going to say again, thank you all so, so much for joining us today for this conversation. I think we covered so many amazing topics from writing technique to the biz to, you know, just the, the, the thematics of writing and what, what the power of writing can have in society. So thank you all so much for joining us for this East West Wednesday and uh, keep creating, keep watching TV out there and we'll, we'll see you around. All right, thanks for having us. Great to see you all. Great to see you guys. Yeah. Hey, 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 Thank you.